and thank you for joining us for Northwest Newsweek. I'm Riley McManus. After 27 years representing Thunder Bay Superior North, Michael Gravel has decided not to run in the upcoming provincial election. Gravel announced earlier this month that his cancer had returned and it's now become clear to him that focusing on his health is what's most important at this point in his life. Corey Nordstrom spoke with Gravel about the difficult decision and the many accomplishments over his lengthy career. It was an emotional day for Michael Gravel. After serving seven terms as an MPP, including over a decade in cabinet, Gravel will not be running again this June. Upon learning that his lymphoma had returned, he knew a decision needed to be made quickly. I pushed off as far as I could, to tell you the honest truth, because I very much wanted to run, and that was my intention. So uh, um, that's why it was a very difficult decision to make, but it became clear to me that what with the, the side effects of the chemotherapy and the challenges I was having from a health care point of view, that I really would have a difficult time running an effective campaign. Since his first election win in 1995, Gravel has seen a lot politically, being a part of majority governments and also seeing his Liberals lose official party status. He served as Minister of Natural Resources and Minister of Northern Development and Mines on multiple occasions. Some of his proudest achievements include the four-laning project from Thunder Bay to Nipigon, the new Thunder Bay Courthouse, and many more. To be able to... Uh, uh, bring uh, in, uh, the use of insulin pumps to those with uh, uh, type 2 diabetes was an important and significant step forward. Uh, a law school here at Lakehead University, a major achievement, one that we uh, certainly did. The work we've done in building Hogarth Riverview Manor, the work that we've done in uh, building an angioplasty clinic. After so many years and accomplishments, what will he miss the most? I'm going to miss the people. I'm going to miss the work. I'm going to miss the fact that... Uh, you know, we've been able to achieve so much by working so hard on so many issues. Gravel's only regret is that he won't be running again this year. Though his career stands for itself, now it's time to focus on his health. I feel still pretty rough. I'm, 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 I've had my first chemotherapy treatments, and uh, as I said, they've been challenging. I've had some side effects I didn't anticipate, but I'm still functioning very well, and uh, we'll continue to do so, and hopefully we'll feel better as each treatment continues. Gravel says he will support the next MPP for Thunder Bay Superior North as best as he can. Corey Nordstrom, TBT News. Politicians from around the Thunder Bay area are reminiscing on the work Gravel has accomplished over his long career and wishing him the best in his recovery. Ontario Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca calls Gravel a true lion of the legislature who's improved the lives of more people than he knows. So I think about the four laning of of highways, I think about the winter maintenance conversations he and I had, I think about the law school at Lakehead, I think about insulin pumps for diabetes, I mean, the list goes on for diabetics, it's just, it is such an exceptional track record of progress and of successfully delivering for the people that I know he has been so honored to represent. So he is a strong individual, he will get through this, he knows he has my full support, the, part, the, the full support of our party, and I, I just want him to be healthy and to, to get healthy as quickly as he possibly can. Michael Gravel was a true gentleman in politics, and he was someone that everyone admired from all uh, political parties. We, uh, you know, saw him as the elder statesman of the area, and he was always encouraging to new politicians, and uh, I really admired him for that. He is almost synonymous with the riding people have known about his work and supported him for, you know, well over two decades. And of course, everybody has uh, worried about this most recent diagnosis of cancer, but uh, he truly has been a driving force here in Thunder Bay Superior North, whether it's work on infrastructure, work on the economy of our region, uh, work on relationships. I think uh, we, all, we all are very grateful for what he said. I'm not sure there was an MPP who truly enjoyed the work more than Michael did. He, he truly loves people and, and he truly loved his work. And so to have to, to, have to step aside and leave that behind, uh, I, can, I, I know from, from talking to him directly and, and even if I hadn't, how difficult uh, it was for him because it's been a big part of his life, as you've mentioned, for a very long time. With the start of the provincial election campaign just days away, the Ontario Liberals appear to be having issues fielding candidates in this region. As of Friday, Stephen Del Duca still doesn't have confirmed candidates in three of the four ridings in the Northwest. 
Janine Seymour is seeking the Liberal nomination in Kenora Rainy River. She ran for the NDP in the recent federal election and is currently going through the Liberals' vetting process. Over in Thunder Bay, Atacokan, Rob Barrett will carry the party banner. The social work consultant is throwing his hat into the political ring for the first time. Barrett says now was the right time to give back to, to the community, which has given so much to his family. First of all, I was approached and I, I talked it over with family and friends and, and I was really touched by the enthusiasm and excitement and, and uh, I thought, yeah, this is a very good time and I feel so privileged uh, to be living, working and playing in northwestern Ontario and we raised a family here in Thunder Bay, my wife and I, four kids and I think it's a great time for me to give back. Meanwhile, the Ontario Green Party has named their four candidates in the Northwest. Anti-poverty advocate Tracy McKinnon is running in Thunder Bay Superior North. Atacokan High School teacher Eric Arner is the Green candidate in Thunder Bay Atacokan. Red Lake's Suzette Foster is the party nominee in Kiwetanung. And Northwestern Health Unit staffer Catherine Keevening from Dryden is running in Kenora Rainy River. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haiju hosted a media conference in Ottawa this week to announce the claims period has opened for the Federal Safe Drinking Water Settlement. Representatives from Niskandiga First Nation were on hand. The remote community has had a boil water advisory in place for over 27 years. Time to act. Enough is enough. Where the most vulnerable are being dictated by somebody else by policies that don't necessarily work in our communities. The Scandica holds the dubious title of having the longest active boil water advisory in Canada. The community's water treatment facility is still incomplete, and Chief and Council do not know when they will discuss lifting the boil water advisory. The settlement includes seven items, including $1.5 billion in compensation for those deprived of clean drinking water, the creation of a First Nations Advisory Committee on Safe Drinking Water, and the commitment of at least $6 billion to support reliable access to safe drinking water. Community members who shared their outlook on the decades-old issue say they've lost hope in the federal government and don't agree with the court ruling for settlement. I'm only entitled for uh, four years plus two years, six years max. That is BS. That's what's, I think, uh, good news about the settlement is that it's not just about individual compensation, which I agree will never make up for ongoing harms in people's lives, but is an acknowledgement of that harm. Eligible members can visit firstnationsdrinkingwater.ca to apply for compensation. Municipal representatives from across the Northwest gathered this week in Fort Francis for the 2022 Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association Conference. It marks the first time in three years many mayors, councillors and other officials have been able to gather in person. Adam Riley has the details from day one and two of the conference. It took some time, but members of the Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association are meeting in person, discussing the issues that affect the communities they represent and the region as a whole. And while policy was top of mind, actually seeing each other in person was definitely a talking point. It's nice to be together and we have our own local issues in the Northwest and, and we're able to share them together in person for a change. It's, it's fantastic. Being together face to face and building those relationships again outside of MS Teams or Zoom is uh, really important. There's just energy, there's excitement and you just accomplish so much more when you're together as opposed to I think the novelty of the Zoom meeting wore off about 18 months ago, to be quite honest. 2022 was a special year for the conference as it falls right before a provincial election. In years previous, this has often led to in-person visits by the leaders of some of the parties. However, this year, none physically showed and instead sent recorded messages, which left many, including NOMA President Wendy Landry, Underwhelmed. That's uh, a bit disappointing from a, from a Northwest perspective. We like it when the leaders come to the corners of our part of the province to remind them where they where we are, to remind them that the issues are, are different. Um, but I mean, you know, they attended virtually, they brought their messages virtually, but I assure you that NOMA's at the table with all of these leaders and making sure they've heard our, our concerns. A highlight of day one was the keynote address on truth and reconciliation from motivational speaker Stan Wesley 
which managed to get attendees up on their feet and moving around, something not often seen at conferences like this. Landry says it's a topic that hits home for her and something that many municipalities within Noma are each working to address. As a First Nations woman, that's something that's uh, important to me as well. So knowing our truth, Stan Wesley talked today about knowing the truth and knowing those stories of our Auntie Edna's and, and how we can relate to all of us having an auntie who has a story in the history of the Northwest, especially. So I think that, um, you know, the message today was welcoming and and um, fun at the same time. But this this fellow was, it was interesting because I, I, I think I saw his first um, presentation a few years ago but this one kind of really brought it home and it, it he made it kind of interesting. Day two had attendees sitting in on seminars on issues and projects that affect communities in the region including transportation of nuclear waste, forestry, climate change and tourism. Adam Riley, TBT News. The third and final day of the 76th Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association Conference wrapped up on Friday. The highlight of the day came from the much-anticipated Bear Pit Session, where municipal leaders were given a chance to grill four representatives of the Ford government on policies. But due to the recall for the release of this week's provincial budget, they only appeared virtually. Kurt Black has the details. Solicitor General Sylvia Jones, Parliamentary Assistant Deepak Anand, and Ministers Greg Rickford and Steve Clark were the Ford government reps tasked with answering the tough, unfiltered questions from municipal leaders of the 36 Noma communities. The opening salvo came from Marathon's Rick Dumas, who questioned Jones on the process for confirming provincial appointees to police service boards due to changes in the structure. With the combination of uh, three, two communities and First Nations community, so uh, a higher appointment level to the boards, can you assure us going forward that these appointments will be made in a timely manner so we can function as a, as a board in a proper manner? Uh, we worked aggressively on filling those appointments um, through the application process. As you know, it is a very uh, strenuous process. It is definitely our goal in government to make sure that in a timely manner, we fill um, these positions. Discussions also move towards municipal insurance rates, which Albertan Councillor Diane Glowaski says municipalities have seen surge in recent years. However, Clark was unable to provide a direct answer as his portfolio for municipal affairs and housing does not have him handling the issue directly. Municipalities have seen an average of increase of 21.5% for 2021 over 2020. Are there any plans to address this issue to help our smaller municipalities deal with these rising costs? Uh, the Attorney General did indicate that uh, he was going to move forward on a, uh, on a working group uh, on joint and several liability. I also know that Minister Bethlehem Falvey, as uh, part of his regulatory work with uh, FISRA, uh, is also looking at, uh, at, at the relationship. In contrast to years previous, where ministers were physically in the room, there wasn't as much intensity in the bear pit session. However, Noma President Wendy Landry says she understands the situation the ministers were put in and appreciates their effort. Unfortunately, they called a budget meeting and a cabinet meeting on Thursday. So um, I got some text messages and some phone calls from those ministers that unfortunately had to choose to attend the budget and cabinet meetings instead of coming to Noma. But they all expressed their heartfelt uh, regrets that they couldn't be here. They too wanted to see all of uh, our elected officials that are in the room today. With Noma now wrapped up for the year, municipal leaders will now finish off their term. Unknown as the who will be back for Noma 2023 following the municipal elections this fall. Kurt Black, TBT News. When we come back, three communities band together to address rising policing costs.
Three communities in the Northwest say policing costs have risen so much over the years, it's forced them to band together to find a solution. In a release, the city of Kenora and the towns of Sioux Lookout and Pickle Lake, which are all policed by the OPP, say their municipalities have collectively paid $4 million more a year for policing than the average cost in other communities since 2015. Of the 306 communities policed by the OPP, the median per property cost is $300, but it is nearly triple for that for Kenora, Sioux Lookout, and Pickle Lake, which pay $832, $934, and $950 respectively. Kenora Mayor Dan Raynard says his community will be on the hook for $6 million this year. We're paying $4.3 million more. Think what we could do in the community with 4.3 million. You know, the first thing people say, well, you can give us a tax break. Well, sure we could. And then we could also still have money left over to invest, you know, in all those bridges that we have that we have to look after. The decaying infrastructure, you know, um, investments in recreation, things that enhance the, the community. The end goal for all three communities is to work with the province to see a solution. Otherwise, they may have to further reduce services to residents and businesses. Greenstone OPP have arrested eight people following a violent incident in Geraldton on the night of April 21st. Two males reportedly suffered stab wounds and were flown to Thunder Bay with non-life-threatening injuries. The suspects arrested range in age from 16 to 41 and face a total of 44 charges, including aggravated assault, assault with a weapon, break and enter, and robbery with a weapon. The waters have receded, but Fort Francis and many other communities in the Rainy River District remain at a heightened alert level for potential flooding. A slow melt combined with rainstorm that later became a snowstorm and a return to warm temperatures have caused some areas to flood, closing area roads and forcing several communities downstream of the dam to declare states of emergencies. Fort Francis Mayor June Call says things in her community have stabilized for now, but they are continuing to monitor water levels in the lower Rainy River, where some residents and community assets reside. There's a dock out, a dock out by our, our OPP station, and the dock was definitely all out of the water. In 24 hours, it was almost all underwater. It had risen that high already in that area. So, so we're really watching for a while yet and, and having to be very careful and cautious as to what's happening with the, the sanitary sewer system. Call says if the area gets another rainstorm, Fort Francis and the other communities could be in for some trouble, which is unfortunate as this weekend the area is expected to get hit with more rain and temperatures above freezing. Nipigon OPP have charged a Calgary man who is allegedly driving his car more than double the speed limit. The 2019 Hyundai Elantra was clocked doing 190 kilometers an hour on Highway 1117 just west of Nipigon Wednesday. The 25-year-old driver has been charged with stunt driving. His license was suspended for 30 days and his car impounded for 14 days. His next court date is scheduled for June in Nipigon. Coming up after the break, several communities and community-led projects in the Rainy River District get a financial boost from the provincial government.
Several municipalities in the Rainy River District were on the receiving end of some provincial supports in late April for various projects. They came as part of a pre-election tour by Kenora Rainy River MPP Greg Rickford. But as Adam Riley reports, while the dollar amounts for the projects are not very high, they will have a massive impact for those living and working in the area. While many announcements from the provincial government in recent weeks have been in the millions of dollars, Greg Rickford spent some time in the Rainy River District earlier this month announcing smaller funding packets for projects he says would not have been able to happen had a retooling of the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation not taken place just over a year ago. We spent a couple of years taking a close look at it. Uh, we always want to support everyone fairly across the regions, but it was abundantly clear that Indigenous communities and the smaller towns were just missing out on on uh, key projects. Some of those key projects include $198,000 to upgrade safety and accessibility at the Emo Lavalley Community Centre and a further $134,000 to build an outdoor skating rink there. Also, $180,000 has been earmarked to assist the Dansk Township Community Association to upgrade a community hall. Also on the receiving end of funds was the Township of Lavalley, which will be using $41,000 to give a facelift and modernize its community baseball field. Reeve Ken McKinnon says the ball field is a popular asset, attracting users from as far away as Fort Francis and Emo. But he notes funding from higher levels of government is the only way to make much needed infrastructure upgrades, as the tax base for his community is very small. Most of our funding goes just to uh, the daily maintenance of the facility. With these improvements, uh, it's going to be so, so much healthier, safer, and uh, I'm sure it's going to attract you know, more, uh, more participation. Additionally, money was also allocated to various agriculture-based businesses and organizations. Rickford says farming and livestock is a multi-million dollar industry in the district, but following last year's drought, the sector took a hit. And to help it recover, $200,000 will allow a local abattoir to purchase and renovate the building it currently leases. $93,000 in funding is going to the Emo Feed Service to upgrade its operations and expand grain handling abilities. And $47,000 will go to the Rainy River Soil and Crop Improvement Association for a no-till drill. Our product is moving not just to the United States, but in light of some of the global problems happening, uh, challenges, especially we think of Ukraine and, and our hearts are with them, we stand proudly with them, um, but uh, harvest isn't likely to come for, for much of Ukraine. So when the world comes knocking on northern Ontario's doorstep and northwestern Ontario's doorstep, the question is, are we ready? And I think today takes us farther down the road to saying yes. Adam Riley, TBT News. A gas and dash by an East Coast man ended up with him being apprehended in a tree in Dryden area this week. Police were notified of a fuel theft in Thunder Bay and later caught up with the individual and attempted a traffic stop east of Dryden. But the driver collided with the police cruiser and fled. Officers later located the vehicle on the side of a road and discovered the suspect had climbed a tree. Following negotiations, the 37-year-old climbed down and was arrested. He's facing charges of flight from police, dangerous driving, and possession of property obtained by crime. And that wraps up tonight's Northwest Newsweek. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon.